sign goes. Uh, anyway, so the point is that this matrix here is just for rotating the x and y, keeping the z constant. So if I wanted to get an arbitrary orientation, basically what I could do is a series of rotations to get things where I want them. Turns out there are many standards about how to do that. One that most of, many of us know in math and computer vision are Euler angles. Uh, Euler angles say you rotate about z. If, if this was z, you'd rotate, let's pretend z is up. Rotate about z, rotate about the new x, and then you rotate about the new again z. All right. Uh, for those of you who uh, fly airplanes, I think it's heading, pitch, and roll. Maybe it's boats. I don't know. Heading, you orient yourself. So, you know, uh, northwest, you pitch, that's up and down this way, and then you roll, that's rotation about this way, all right? So you've got the world Z, the new X, the new Y. Uh, there's roll, pitch, and yaw. There's azimuth elevation and, I guess, roll, for those of you who are used to launching mortars, azimuth, anyway. Basically, there are these three basic matrices, rotation about the X, Y, and Z. The order matters, okay? We're not going to worry too much, in fact, not at all about getting that order, but what it has is here are the three rotation matrices written as a function of the, their angles. There's the rotation about x, rotation about z, rotation about y. I put them in that order. Why? I have no idea. I, they used to be a different order, but, but it doesn't matter. The idea is that you can rotate about each of these different axes. Now, whether you pre-multiply or post-multiply, that's an issue. So do we do it the x1, then the y1, then the z1, or the z1, the y1, and the x1? And that depends upon whether you're rotating in the new frame or the old frame. Then is theta positive or negative? So you have to worry about these things really well when you do this. And this is why we build spacecraft in simulation before we build them for real. Because when it doesn't work in simulation, the engineer goes, says, I don't know, try negative 20. Because knowing which way your angles go is, is, is a very difficult thing. How about a, just an easier way? Once again, to the rescue is going to come homogeneous coordinates. And we're just going to assume that we have a rotation matrix, okay? So here, I took that top equation at that PB is the rotated version of PA. And now, instead of the identity matrix in the top left and the offset in the right, we have the rotation matrix here, and that's a 3 by 3. So this 0 vector is a 3 by 1 of zeros. So transpose, it's just 0, 0, 0. This is 0, 0, 0 this way, OK? And that makes rotation a matrix multiplication. And again, uh, we're using homogeneous coordinates. And to remind you, unlike translation, rotation is not commutative. So now we can do the total rigid transformation. So a total rigid transformation, if I have some point in the A system, I first have to rotate to get aligned in the B system, and then I have to offset it by whatever the offset of the A system in the B system is. That's what this equation says. Using homogeneous transformation, or homogeneous coordinates, we can do this all in one step. So here we have a rigid transformation, and it's really nice, right? We have our point here, we've rotated it, and then we've translated it. And what that says is we have this single matrix Right, this part here is a 3 by 3, this is a 3 by 1, this is a 1 by 3 of zeros, this is just a 1. So our total transformation matrix is a 4 by 4, and it does the, both the rotation and, transfer and, and translation. Cool, right? It gets better. Thank God. So here, I've written what we had before. We have P in the A-frame expressed in homogeneous coordinates. Here is our 4x4 four four transformation matrix. Here is B expressed in the B frame. And I'm just going to write this as transformation from A to B. But suppose I wanted to go from B to A. Well, that would be written as transformation from B to A, and I'd have the point P in the, in the A frame. But the way to get that transformation is to just invert the A to B to get me the B to A. And then this transformation takes the, the value from the B frame back to the A frame. And the idea is that our transformation matrices, our homogeneous transformation 4x4s, are uh, typically invertible.
And so once we have one that goes from, say, a camera to world frame, we can go from a world to camera frame or, or, or the other way around. And this invertibility of homogeneous transformations is very powerful and used all the time. So to review, translation and rotation. From frame A to B, to express this in the non-homogeneous or regular coordinates, we take the location of some point P in the A frame, we rotate it, and then we translate it. In, in homogeneous coordinates, we write it as this single matrix, where the matrix has the uh, rotation matrix in it in the top left, and the translation vector uh, located here in the right-hand column. And the key is that homogeneous coordinates allow us to write these coordinate transforms as a single matrix. But I've said that four times already, so you're saying, like, get on with it already. So now, finally, we can talk about going from world to camera frame. Here's our equation using sort of non-homogeneous regular coordinates, where the idea is if we have some point P in the world, so that's a point location in the world frame, we have to rotate it oriented with, to know which way it would be oriented in the camera frame. And then we have the translation from the world to camera frame. Okay? So we have the sort of ugly equation that would get us from a point in the world to a point in the camera. Uh, so that P in the C frame, that's now the point in the camera frame. In homogeneous coordinates, it's just expressed like this. The top left 3 by 3 is the coordinate. The right-hand column is the translation. And that whole 4 by 4 is referred to as the extrinsic parameter matrix. Okay? This is the thing that transforms a point in the world to a point in the camera frame. By the way, that bottom row is not so important unless we're doing inverses. That bottom row is what makes this equation invertible. So when sometimes we're doing projection, we're going to use the 3 by 4 instead of the 4 by 4, but uh, don't worry about that till the next lecture. That brings us to an interesting quiz. How many degrees of freedom are there in the 3 by 4 extrinsic parameter matrix? So 12, there are 12 numbers, B, 6, C, 9, or D, 3. All right, well, what's the answer? Well, the answer is still 6. Remember, there was 6 degrees of freedom? There are th only three angles, raw, uh, heading, pitch, and roll, uh, Euler, uh, omega, phi, kappa, whatever. There are three angles that define that rotation matrix. So that it's not nine independent numbers, right? There's only three angles. And then there are three translational values. And that's why there are still six extrinsic parameters, even though we can use a 3 by 4 or sometimes even a 4 by 4. So we've just basically taken a way of turning those six numbers into a matrix form that allows us to apply it to the location of the points in one frame to get the location of the points in another frame. So that ends the lesson on extrinsics or extrinsic, not really calibration, because we're going to do the calibration part. So I should change the title of it. That was about extrinsic geometry. Later, we're going to do extrinsic calibration, where we figure out how a camera is oriented in the world. We're going to have to revisit this whole thing when we talk about mapping from world points to a location on an image plane. All right. Um, but before we can do that, we're going to have to talk about, once I have the location of a point in a camera frame, where does that point end up in the image? And that's the intrinsics, and we're going to do that at the next lesson. Welcome back, uh, Introduction to Computer Vision. Today we're going to be talking about intrinsic camera calibration. Last time we said that we're going to do geometric calibration in general, and that there were two parts to calibration. The first transformation is from some arbitrary world coordinate system to the camera system or the camera pose. And this was the extrinsic parameters. And it mapped from world coordinates to camera coordinates or camera coordinates to world, depending upon how you think about it. When we write it as T, W to C, it takes you from the world uh, to the camera. We expressed it in terms of homogeneous coordinates, where we had a world coordinate P here expressed in that world coordinate frame. It was homogeneous, so there's a 1 down there. And we pump it through both the rotation component and the translation component to get the three-dimensional point in camera coordinates. And that uh, world-to-camera matrix encodes what we refer to as the extrinsic parameters, or the extrinsic parameter matrix. We also said that that encodes six degrees of freedom, three translation, three rotation. Today, we're going to talk about the second transformation, which goes from the 3D camera coordinates 
to the 2D image coordinates or the 2D image plane. And these are referred to as the intrinsic parameters. And we'll again come up with an intrinsic parameter matrix. So you might say, well, didn't we already do this? We did the ideal perspective projection where we said that some value u was just going to be the focal length times x divided by z and v was, was y divided by z multiplied by f as well. So you might ask, aren't we done? Well, no, because that would be in some idealized world. The first problem going back to here is f might be in you know, millimeters. So we might have a 10 millimeter lens or a 50 millimeter lens. But the pixels, the screen pixels, they're in some arbitrary coordinate. Right? That depends upon exactly how many pixels we get per millimeter in the sensor. So the first thing that happens is that we introduce an alpha that's just going to scale that value because we don't really know what f is. Now, sometimes people will give you an f, a focal length, in pixels, which is kind of a weird thing. But what they're actually doing is they're giving you this combined value that is sort of the conversion from millimeters to pixels times millimeters just giving you two in pixels. But basically, because they may be in some arbitrary units, we have a scale factor alpha. So that's one degree of freedom. But who said the pixels are square? Megan, did you say pixels are square? No. Now, it turns out pixels are more square now than they used to be. They used to be cool, and now they're, no, never mind. Anyway, pixels are more square now than they used to be. It used to be back in television, more of television days, pixels had the same aspect ratio as actually a television. So a pixel was uh, wider than it was tall, and some other things, they were tall than they were wide. They weren't necessarily fixed. In fact, even some CCD arrays uh, that I, calibrated once, it turned out that, well, it was almost square. It was like 95% of the height was equal to the width, all right? So because they're not exactly square, you might have a separate scaling factor between the U direction and the V direction. And so now we've introduced beta, so now we have two degrees of freedom. But we're not done. Next, well, you remember we put the center of projection when we were doing the ideal projection, we put the center of projection uh, right at the camera coordinate system, as if the image was taken so that zero, zero was right in the middle. But of course, we don't have any guarantee of this, right? The image may have been cropped out of a, uh, a section of the window, or the, the location of the image actual sensor might, meet, might not be lined up with the optical axis of the camera. So we have two offsets, a U and a V offset, U0, V0. So now we're up to one, two, three, four degrees of freedom, two scale factors and two offsets. Are we done yet? But wait, there's more. Here comes the really ugly one. We're assuming that the U direction and the V direction are actually perpendicular. What if there's actually a little bit of a skew? So U and V went out drinking one night and they came back just off a little bit. All right. So that's what's shown in this figure here. The idea is that the ideal U and V are this way. Okay, but maybe the sensor is actually sampled that way and that way. That is, that the, the actual sampling of UV is not are not perpendicular and they're off by some angle theta. So that's what these equations are showing you here. They're showing you the relationship between the V prime, which is measured, and the actual V, the U prime, and the actual U. And so when you substitute those, into those uh, equations we just had, you get this sort of ugliness, okay? So this is the really ugly extrinsic, uh, sorry, intrinsic parameter uh, representation. And now we have how many? Well, we've got an alpha and a beta, the two scale factors, that's two degrees of freedom, a u0 and v0 for the two offsets, plus theta, which is the skew. This is pretty ugly, and we'd like to make it nicer. And we're going to do that through two ways. First. So here we have those uh, ugly equa equations, and the first thing you'll notice is, kind of like before, we're dividing the x's and the y's by z, all right? And so that should tell you that, uh, see, I wrote up here intrinsic parameters in non-homogeneous coordinates. Well, guess what? We're going to move to homogeneous coordinates by putting this whole thing in a matrix formulation. So now we can express the whole thing in homogeneous coordinates. Notice that here we have z times u, z times v, z. So later when we convert back from homogeneous to non-homogeneous, we divide by z and we get what we want. We have the x, y, z, 1 over here, and we have this matrix in the middle. So we can rewrite this as sort of as a very simple equation where 
we have